بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم السلام عليكم السلام عليكم انا فاطمه انا كنت في الجلسه في الوقت الاسبوع so um, i'm going to be first introducing you to sleep okay um, hopefully not going to sleep in the process um, and i'll talk briefly about the Islamic perspective i'm not a sheikha or i'm not like a scholar or even remotely knowledgeable in that respect but um, i'm just going to be regurgitating a few things that i learned um, we'll, first, we'll also talk a little bit about why we need sleep, which is something that we actually take a lot for granted. Um, and we'll talk about what it looks like, or what I see it looks like. Um, and a, a little bit more about sleep deprivation and a guide to good sleeping. So, um, sleep, as Rob Byron once said, is um, uh, death so called as a thing which makes men weep. And yet a third of our lives is spent in sleep. So it's a huge chunk of our lives and we do take it for granted. And it is a bizarre thing. Um, you'll die sleep faster from sleep deprivation than food deprivation. Um, and it's also involuntary, so you can't control it. It will happen to you whether you like it or not. Um, and your conscious will be flat um, and you won't be able to control anything. So it is a bizarre phenomenon um, that I think we do take for granted. It's very important because there's more acts, uh, car accidents related to sleepiness um, than drunkenness. So please do think about your sleep. Um, so in the Quran, uh, a lot of things, as well as sleep, is considered a mercy from Allah, from God, and the best example is to forget, um, which is wise to read on a Friday. <laughs> um, so there was a... Um, young men who were being persecuted and they asked Allah for help and Allah set them to sleep for 309 years. So that's a pretty big mercy. Um, there's more, you have to read the whole sort of geth of it, it's, it's beautiful, read about it. Um, it's also con considered a sign or like a miracle from Allah to, to um, prove his existence. Um, uh, and it's mentioned in Surah al -Hum, which is epic. <laughs> Um, it's a brilliant story, you should read it as well. Um, so, uh, in Surah al uh, Allah says that he's given us night to sleep with and day to seek his bounty, to do good. So, uh, we shouldn't sleep too much. Um, uh, it's also mentioned as a form of rest uh, in Surah al uh, So, there's a bunch of, there's a war going on, lots of believers were really like anxious and like really worried that they were going to die. So, Allah gave them a, a dose of going to sleep to rest and feel a bit um, hang on, no, I'm thinking of the wrong one. I screwed up. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, in Surah Al-Qasas, uh, Allah says that you made the night for us to sleep and the day for us to uh, seek his bounty. And um, Al-Ghazali uh, wonderfully said that uh, sleep is abundant waste of time, um, which I agree with. He says uh, that sleep hardens and deadens the heart unless, that is, it be done only in that amount which is needed. Um, so I also agree with that because sleep takes up a third of our lifetime and that's a big chunk of time that's wasted when you could be doing good or when you could protect yourself from a grizzly bear. Um, he also said, do not eat much lest you should drink much which will cause you to sleep much which, and therefore to lose much. Because as the young Qayyam asks, Allah has been asked, what did you do with your life? And if you say, sleeping, it's not, it's not good. Uh, so uh, that's uh, in Al Ghazali's uh, Discipline of the Soul, Breaking the Two Desires. Uh, in the Quran, so it's Zumar, black sleep is, meant like, is likened to death. So Allah says that uh, he, take, when everyone, uh, he takes everyone's souls at the time of death and also at the time of sleep, and he will give back, give back those um, who are not meant to die at that moment in time. So um, when you're sleeping, you can't really do much. Um, you're not in control. You don't make decisions. So it's not actually like you're living, if that makes sense. So um, it's not just the Quran that's mentioned. There's Gandhi and a whole bunch of other people who like to sleep to death. So, um, uh, so this is the bit of the war. So in Surah al um there was a bunch of people that were going to war. And they were very scared. So Allah sent them to sleep to feel a bit more secure. Uh, okay. So, in the Sunnah, uh, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do a door before he'd go to sleep. He'll also clean his bedding because if anyone's gone to Saudi Arabia, it's very, very dusty because he's not ready to write my call. Um, so he would clean his bedding before he went to sleep. It's practical. He'd also turn off the lamps, the thing is they're out of the fire, so you don't want to burn the house down. 
so they would turn off their lamps. But the thing is, uh, restriction of light um, before sleep is also important to sort of wire yourself down so you can go to sleep. Um, you'd also sleep on the right side. Um, there's studies to show that this is good for you, but they're all a bit inconclusive. Um, there's many hadith that says don't sleep on your belly, it's disliked. Um, and it's actually not very good for spinal uh, uh, support, so it's best to sleep in a, another position. Um, the Rasul uh, Rasul also used to have afternoon naps, uh, which is mentioned uh, more in detail in Surah Um And this is mainly because it was so hot in the afternoon that no one could function or stay awake. Um, so there's a big nap debate over whether it's good for you or not, but um, it's wise not to have a nap too late in the evening or afternoon. Um, so I put a bunch of wires in people's heads and look at what's inside their brains. So um, this is what I see. So this is 30 seconds. Of, um, and um, the green lines are eyeball movements and the black lines are brain activity or brain waves. Um, and uh, you've got a simple ECG here and we also look, we put some electrodes on the chin to look at possible sort of, um, talking or grinding of teeth, etc. We've got some leg movements here and um, we look at breathing as well. So this is wake and the activity is quite fast um, because your brain is quite active. Um, stage one is kind of like uh, your intermittent zone between sleep and wake. You get a bit drowsy, you get a bit dozy. Your eyes will start to roll, so it's called an astagmus. You see people on the train and go like, like that a bit. So that's what these rolling line movements mean. Um, the brain activity will slow down a bit, um, but not a lot. Um, and in stage two sleep, which is considered light sleep, your brain activity is slowed down a lot, and your chin muscle turn has gone down a bit as well. There's no eye movements though. Um, and in stage three, three sleep, which is my favorite, your brain activity <laughs> is massive, massive, slow wave sleep. Um, and this is where your deep sleep comes in. So if you wake someone up at this stage, they'll be disorientated and confused or remember who you are, it's really fun to play a prank on them at this time. Um, and <coughs> finally, in rapid eye movement sleep, or what we know as dreaming sleep, um, it's characteristic because you've got really beautiful eye movements. Um, they're very fast, very active. Your brain activity has gone a bit faster and it actually almost looks like wake. Um, probably because your brain's just very active when you're dreaming and lots of things are being connected at the same time. Your chin tone, uh, which tells us the electricity of the, of the chin and in the muscle of the chin, is almost flat and this is because you've become paralyzed. And this is a normal phenomenon, which happens to everyone, and it should do because otherwise you act out your dreams and it might cause problems. Um, so, um, a hippogram. So when we've analysed the whole sleep, we have like a big graph at the end, uh, and it tells us um, what stage of sleep the patient was in at what time. Normally, you'll have most of your deep sleep in the first half of the night, and most of your dreaming in the second half of the night. Although a, a typical hippogram never looks like this. You'll always have awakenings. People will move uh, in your awakening. You just will never remember it. So why do we need sleep? Well, there's many theories. No one actually knows, and it's actually it's, it's not fact. It's not, not written in stone. So it's kind of like a pun a lot. Um, so firstly, for rest and recuperation, your body is moving all the time, and uh, there's lots of wear and tear. So your body sometimes just needs to force itself to shut down in order to have time to repair itself. Um, it's also thought that memory consolidation plays a big part in uh, sleeping because you. you accumulate a lot of memories during the day, and a lot of the time you don't actually need those memories. So it's possible that when you sleep, your brain is chucking them out, deleting, deleting a lot of this junk from your hard drive. Um, but it's also important to sort of reaffirm memories that you really need, like uh, the person that hit you that day or so. Um, finally, it's thought that you need sleep for energy conservation. So um, you use up a lot of brain, uh, glucose and a lot of energy, your brain uses up pretty much the most. It takes a a lot of energy, a lot of glucose to work to, for the brain to work. Um, the thing is, it's kind of a sort of a semi-weak argument because your energy level only drops a little bit when you're asleep compared to what you use during the day. Uh, so when you're sleep deprived, it's a really horrible thing. 
So George Orwell, in Darren and Asma Crowson London, said that work in the hotel taught me the true value of sleep, just as being hungry taught me the true value of food. Um, sleep had ceased to be a mere physical necessity. It was something voluptuous and brought more than a relief. And having worked at night time myself and known what sleep deprivation is, I can really, really understand what this means. You really don't understand the true value of it until you've lost it. Um, so what happens when you're sleep deprived is you've got very poor memory. Um, not, not very poor. In the beginning, just say one day without sleep, you're actually, your function's okay. You're a bit crazy, but your function's still all right. With, with continued sleep deprivation, your memory will be quite bad. You'll forget things. Um, and you won't be able to focus. <coughs> so it's very difficult to maintain tasks. Uh, you'll be cognitively dysfunctional. So when I was working at night time, I wouldn't be able to string a proper sentence. I'd have the words coming in at the wrong times, and the letters would be all jumbled up. Even though it made perfect sense in my brain, it didn't come out very well. Um, you'd also have emotional imbalances, so I would cry a lot. A lot. Um, and uh, you also have hormonal imbalances because melatonin, which is your normal sleep hormone, is just crazy. It's gone off path. Um, you'd end up wanting to eat more because you've deprived your brain of something that you really need so it will seek out everything else that it shouldn't have, like sugar and chips and more sugar and more chips. Uh, <laughs> so um, you'll end up having hallucinations as well. Um, and you'll end up having paranoid of it because your frontal lobe, uh, which deals with reason and logic, is kind of shut down a bit, um, and your, signal, your neuronal signaling has kind of it's gone off the wrong way, and you'll end up being more paranoid because of it. So, like my boss would tell me, oh, you haven't, why, have you done this job? And I'll be like, no, and then I'll be thinking, oh, he thinks I can't do it, which means I'm going to get sacked, and that's how your process will go. Um, you'll end up being manic and eventually die. Um, so it's very important to sleep. Um, there was a very interesting case in 1965 of a guy called Randy Gardner, um, who was 18 at the time, and he participated in an experiment uh, to try and beat a world record of sleep deprivation. He stayed awake for, I think, 264 hours, which comes up to 11 days. Um, and uh, it, he, he thought that a pole was a person um, they asked him to, count, to, to detect 7 from 100, and when he got to 65, he stopped, and the researchers asked him, why did you stop? He said, I can't remember why I'm doing this. <laughs> um, the thing is, uh, it's very well documented, you should go and look at it if you but um, it's not actually the world record, I think the world record is 18 days without sleep. Don't try it, just don't try it, it's not worth it. Um, so, a guide to good, sleep, uh, to good sleeping is also called sleep hygiene. Um, it's best to limit your light exposure, so um, if you want to turn off your televisions, your computers, your phones. I'm a big hypocrite, um, but it really, it really helps if you limit the light stimulation you're getting. Um, also, be wise with your time management, so um, adults need about eight hours of sleep, or seven and a half, and um, there's a, a kind of an epidemic in... Um, Western continents where people are just being more sleep deprived, they're only getting six and a half hours of sleep or six. Um, and it's really affecting the way people work um, and their addiction on caffeine. Um, so it's best to go to sleep at a regular time and wake up at a regular time. And if you want to have a lion on the weekend, <laughs> one hour. So, um, caffeine. People drink a lot of caffeine. Now, the way caffeine works is it looks very similar to a substance called adenosine. And adenosine is a kind of a metabolic product um, from uh, your energy breakdown. And, um, so you've got packets of um, energy called ATP, and they break down and the product is called adenosine. And this builds up in your brain as the day goes on. The more it builds up, the more tired you'll feel. The way caffeine works is that because it looks so much like adenosine, it will block up the receptors in your brain, which are meant for adenosine, <coughs> and lie to your brain and tell you you're awake when you're not. Um, so if you're going to have caffeine, uh, of keep it a, a morning thing or an early afternoon thing, not, not me even at all. You won't sleep, not good. Um, I don't know, hopefully none of you drink alcohol, but it also um, affects your sleep. <laughs> um, and it also increases your body temperature uh, when, it's, uh, when, when your body temperature is meant to go down when you want to sleep. Now, um, if you go to the gym and exercise um, a lot, uh, try to limit it. Don't, don't, not limit it. Don't go to the gym two hours before you go to sleep. 
um, because you'll be exhausted, but your brain is still wired, and you'll go to bed thinking, I'm exhausted, go to bed, go to sleep, and it won't happen. So um, keep it like a morning or an afternoon thing, not, not in the evening. Read, please, um, from traditional books and papers and words on them. Um, it will slow your brain down, and you'll be able to focus, um, and you'll be able to sort of um, think about something else other than the tragedies of your day. Um, and it really does help slow your brain down and prepare you to go to sleep. Um, keep the air nice and quiet. I have not been able to sleep in an environment where it's not quiet. Um, when there's lots of activity or noise happening, it goes into your auditory system through your ears, and uh, your brain, active, brain is still working, so it's actually making your brain work, so keep it quiet and let your brain shut down. Um, make sure you're in a cool environment, because when it's too hot, as everyone knows in the summer, it's very hard to sleep, because your body temperature is meant to go down. The thing is, sometimes people, like myself, with very cold hands and feet, and actually keeps you awake. So, um, put some socks on, clean ones, um, and go to bed. <laughs> um, and, uh, as Albert Kim said, some people talk in their sleep, while lecturers talk while other people sleep. <laughs> I hope that wasn't the case today. Thank you for listening to me.
matches the prevalence of asthma, diabetes, so it's pretty common. And unfortunately, only as you can see there, 20% of people are actually detected who have this problem. So most people out there with sleep apnea are simply not being diagnosed. Why does it matter? Well, as Fatima mentioned earlier, if you're sleepy, then you won't perform as well. And uh, I put here, people with sleep apnea have a high risk of motor vehicle accidents. They have about seven times the risk of someone who doesn't have sleep apnea. In fact, around 20% of road traffic accidents are caused by people falling asleep at the wheel. And the great sadness about those accidents are they're far more likely to be lethal or cause great damage to individuals and, and vehicles because if we're just a bad driver, we're driving too fast, we make a miscalculation about overtaking on a bend, then we will try and steer ourselves out of problems. If you fall asleep at the wheel, you just plough on, you plough across the central reservation, you hit cars coming the other way, you plough off the road, and that's why they're so dangerous. Uh, if that's not enough, then the additional problems with sleep apnea, it's becoming clearer now it is a significant risk factor for heart disease. Like we all know having a high cholesterol is a risk factor, or having a high blood pressure, or being overweight, sleep apnea is a risk factor too. Um, and it's because of these recurrent uh, episodes of airway obstruction, and then the arousals that go with it, uh, that stimulates the release of adrenaline and noradrenaline, which is bad for us, that's the wired. Um, but also, the dips in the oxygen level that occur with the stopping breathing are a stress on the system, it's something called oxidative stress, and that increases the risk of atherosa and the furring up of arteries in the heart or going to the brain, so that's why people have more heart attacks and strokes. And the high levels of catecholamines in the metabolic axis increase the prevalence of metabolic disorders like diabetes. Fatima described how she felt after working at night. That's something else I've learned tonight, that Fatima's rotor is not ideal at work, so we'll have to look into that. Um, and it does affect performance the next day, so we don't perform as well at work, or uh, sadly children at school, Sleep apnea in children is, is predominantly caused by large tonsils and adenoids, and so five, six, seven year olds, that's the time when our, our tonsils are the greatest, they can have problems with not sleeping well, snoring, and actually performing worse than their classmates because of this problem. <coughs> and then there are, there are effects on mood and memory. Uh, worse than that, so you can have all that happen, but it also takes years of your life if you have untreated sleep apnea. And what you can see from those sort of survival cohorts is basically if you look at the top line, the dotted line, the black line, that's someone with, we count the number of apneas and hypopneas, which are partial events, per hour. And if you've got less than five per hour, which is the top line, then you're essentially normal. The red line is someone who is having more than 30 episodes an hour of stopping breathing, that's severe obstructive sleep apnea. And you can see your survival probability if you're not treated, is markedly reduced. And this is just showing, too, to make the point that people with the sleep apnea, this is the group here, again, the red group, who uh, have severe sleep apnea, and this is the incidence of heart attacks, and you can see over 144 months that incident rising greatly, compared to those who are snorers, the black line here, uh, these ones are the controls, so these are normal people. Look at this great increase. In fact, probably you're going to have 30% increase over the next 10 years of having a heart attack. But the good news is you can reduce this so you can go down from the red line here to the blue line if you're treated with particular uh, therapy called CPAP. So uh, the good news story is uh, that if you have CPAP near, if you're on the right treatment, you could reduce your risk right back down virtually to someone without it, but at least at a similar level to a smaller. Some people like looking at graphs like this, some people like bar charts, but this is essentially showing the same thing. Compared to normal people, if you have your OSA, which your sleep apnea is treated, <coughs> then you revert back to uh, the same risk as that control person's heart, heart attack. 
So just to run through treatments, the more overweight you are, the more you're likely to have apneas. Uh, actually, overweight people tend to put on weight around the neck, uh, and that adds to the mass effect when we lie back and the airway tending to, to flop shut. If you smoke, you'll inevitably have, um, I'm sure you don't, but you'll inevitably have, if you do, inflamed uh, mucosa of the airways, which worsens the problem. So don't do those things. Um, an ENT review, that's ear, nose and throat therapy, uh, to the, um, surgical review, just to make sure there's no obvious problems, polyps in the nose, big tonsils, adenoids. Dental splints are sometimes called mandibular bars, but splint is quite a good treatment as well because you pop these over your teeth at night and it lifts, they lift for the lower jaw and if you do that you open up the airway and it's less likely to flop shut. That, that picture might make you laugh, but that is the most effective treatment. If you've got severe sleep apnea, I'm not talking about this if you're a snorer, because I'm sure that might upset some people. If you've got severe sleep apnea, there is no tablet in the universe that is going to stop your airway flopping shut. This is a device which is a simple pressure pump. You put a mask on when you're ready to go to sleep, and it looks more complicated than it is. And this machine just sucks in air from the bedroom, nothing to do with oxygen therapy. It blows into the nose and upper airway and just actually inflates the airway like a pneumatic splint so it doesn't flop shut. They're very straightforward. You can use them a baby through to an 88-year-old. Uh, and once you get used to it, it takes about two or three minutes to put on and off people go to sleep. So that was being too sleepy. Uh, insomnia... It is a pretty big problem. Um, at some point uh, in our lives, in most of us, we're going to experience insomnia, whether it's because we're stressed, because we've got an exam, we're worried about uh, personal events, we have a job interview, all sorts of stresses, and that does affect sleep quality. And probably 10% of the population, when you do surveys, can complain of, of <coughs> insomnia at, at any one time. It can be simple or primary insomnia, and that's largely, is, as I just mentioned, related to events. Um, and usually it solves itself, so there's an upset, one deals with it, and one moves on, and gradually sleep returns to the previous passion. But if it becomes persistent, and usually we describe that as it's got to be present for at least a month, and also it's affecting your daytime performance. So true insomnia has to be Intransigent, it's not going away, it's not obviously related anymore to some, some event, um, and it's actually impacting on that person's um, daytime experience and performance. We also divide it into two types. Some people find it difficult to get to sleep, and that can be um, stressful in its own right, because people then get in a vicious cycle, I can't get to sleep, I've got to do this in the morning. <laughs> Um, I'm still not asleep, it's 1am, uh, it's 3am, I'm still not asleep and that feeds into itself. There is also sleep maintenance insomnia where you actually get to sleep but you keep waking up subsequently and some people unfortunately have both. Tactics that you need can, can vary a little between those types uh, of insomnia and there are definite effects of gender. Actually insomnia is, is reported more in females than males. Uh, and does tend to get worse as we get older. So what, what do you do about it? Well, I think um, a, a proper evaluation, trying to break it down into these categories. Are there particular events that, that stimulated it? Can those events be manipulated? Because that's obviously the best way to do it. Um, to exclude other uh, obvious causes, I, I'm going to come back to disorders of the body clock, but there are some people who are slightly out of phase with a normal 24-hour cycle. Actually, teenagers are a good example because they are always wanting to go to bed later at night, later and later at night, and get, get up later and later in the morning. So they have a, a fairly delayed sleep cycle, whereas very elderly people can tend to want to go to bed earlier and have a sort of advanced sleep-based syndrome. So you just have to work out that it's not that they're out of phase with everyone else. And then there are, the, the, there are other obvious things, pain, can fragment sleep, arthritis, um, a range of problems with uh, nerve problems, um, restless legs, a, a range of those problems. Back
Fatima talked about sleep hygiene measures, and obviously, if you have a double espresso before you go to bed, you are going to have sleep onset insomnia. There's no way around it. Um, exercise, she mentioned too. Exercise is good if you have insomnia, but you need to do it regularly and at a time in the day when it's not going to have heated you up before you go to bed. Sleeping tablets are not a good thing to take long term, but they can be good strategically to kind of knock people back into a normal sleep pattern, and then of course you can withdraw them. And one needs to think about the half-life of any medication, the amount of time it lasts, because you will need a very short-acting medication for someone who's got sleep onset insomnia, and a much longer-acting one, or a medium-acting one, of someone who could get to sleep and then wakes up for really through the night. If all those tactics uh, don't work, then cognitive behavioural therapy, um, or CBT, you may know it as, has actually been subject to randomised controlled trials and does work in insomnia. And that's really uh, a, a way of helping you manipulate and get your sleep back to how it should be. And it's largely dealing with some of the maladaptive practices people adopt. So if you're an insomniac, or you're having extreme problems, people start to develop tactics which they hope are going to deal with it. Um, so they think, well, I'm awake in the night, why don't I get up and do some work? Or they try to uh, watch a television at night, see if they can have a television in the bedroom, see if they can help. That helps them drop them off to sleep. A lot of those adaptive behaviours actually exacerbate the problem, and some of positive behavioural therapy is to do with teasing out uh, the secondary uh, adaptions to, to uh, deal with the problem. It also uh, focuses on sleep restriction so that you actually, the time you're in bed, that you get some sleep, and then they gradually work on increasing that until your sleep comes back to a relatively normal level. I'm just going to run through uh, before we end jet lag, because I think anyone who's been on a long haul flight probably knows what that's like. It's small writing, so I'll read it out. But important with jet lag, but it, 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 it's typified really with people having problems with their day and night time, their day and night time sleep, so they're sleeping during the day, they're awake at night. Um, poor concentration, as you can see, impaired performance, fatigue. Irritability, disorientation, and GI upset, and mal upset. And, um, and the, the bottom line here is this is misalignment of our own body clock, which is set to London time. And if we go forward in time uh, to the Middle East or Japan, then we're, the clock advances. If we go back in time and fly to the US, then the time is behind us. Um, and so it's this malalignment of our clock with the clock <coughs> in the city or um, country we're going to. Just going on short haul trips, of course, is not a problem. You have to really go across the three time zones, and probably adaption worsens with age. We're better able to do it as teenagers in our 20s, and, and as you get older, we're not as good. And, and, and something that I haven't appreciated is I, one tends to think that people who are flight crew or people who are flying all the time will have found a way of, of dealing with this. In fact, there's no evidence that they are better able biologically to cope with jet lag, but they just, they just develop better coping strategies. And probably people attracted to that kind of shift work or that kind of routine may genetically be more suited to doing it. It's always worse when we're travelling east than travelling west because travelling east the clock is advancing and we're less able in our brain to adapt to that than going backwards and going and flying into New York for example when after you arrive you will have a longer time ahead of you before you go to bed because of the clock being behind us. Uh, so what's the plan? Well, uh, first tip is really think about where you're going, think about the time and your place of, of destination. And if you want to adapt a bit quicker, then you can start to adjust your sleep time. For example, if you're traveling east, you're going to Japan or, or Saudi or wherever, you would want to bring your bedtime forward. 
There's no point in doing it by two or three hours because you're not going to sleep. But maybe by doing it for half an hour or an hour, then you can do that for a few nights before you go. It's also quite sensible as soon as you get on the plane to go on to destination time. So change your watch then rather than wait so the air hostess says, you know, just before your landing, the time is 20 past 7 and everyone fiddles with their watch. Um, it's good also to have a light meal and if you're doing an overnight flight, say coming back from the US, usually nighttime flights, then have a light meal in the evening and then when you are arriving at Heathrow or wherever Manchester, wherever the next morning, make sure you have a decent breakfast. Have the uh, appetizer drink, um, have a proper breakfast, because that will start your met metabolism going and start getting you back synced into your destination meal times and body clock times. Melatonin, um, as, as Fatima mentioned, is a natural hormone that actually is a something that helps us settle down at night because it starts to be secreted as dusk arises and as uh, dusk comes and night uh, falls then melatonin levels increase so that we are aware that we're becoming sleepier as it gets to 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night and we're ready for sleep. Of course there are melatonin tablets, there are problems with that. First of all, th there is evidence that taking melatonin tablets might help you reset your body clock, but they're not good quality studies and it's difficult to buy melatonin tablets in the UK. When you buy them in the US, you're not quite sure what you're getting and, and whether you should take 2 milligrams or 5 milligrams is not clear. What does work though is light therapy and so fixing light therapy to reset your body clock and I'll give you one example shortly. Secondly, when you are, or thirdly or fourthly, when you are going to sleep at night, then with Fatima's comment to completely black out the room, um, especially if you're in this jet lag situation and you want to pull the curtains right shut. If there's light coming in, you're in a hotel, coming in under the door, then put a towel along there, get, get it really dark at night, then you're much more likely to sleep and get consolidated sleep. Then during the day, you want to maintain your alertness, and there actually is some, some evidence that you can use caffeine strategically to do that. This is the one trial I think Starbucks should sponsor. If you can use them for anything, then it would be exploring the value of caffeine. Um, but a few cups of coffee in the morning to get you going, but not later in the day or in the evening because you're secretly fragmented. And you, can, you can develop travel planners for people. So this was a travel planner that was drawn up for, for a bank and he was flying to, to Washington to go to the um, the IMO, some financial business and, and so he's travelling west um, and the way we try to manipulate this and to um, let's go back, and to try and adapt him more quickly was to use light exposure. So if you want you've gone to the US uh, they are behind us in time so the best thing you, you you need to do when you get there, this is on US time, is seek bright light later on in the day. Now, this is nine, oh, this is seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Of course, it's not necessarily going to be sunshine then, but if you're in your room, if you're working, if you're moving around in a hotel, seek bright light and ensure bright light is getting to the back of your retina. And by having brighter light later on into the evening, you are pushing and adapting your body clock more to the US time. And then the next day you adapt it further. Conversely, when you fly back into Heathrow the next day, you've got to advance your body clock because UK time is ahead of, of, of US time. And the difficulty is that most of the overnight flights are coming into Heathrow 6, 7 a.m. in the morning. And that's just the wrong time you want bright light because you want bright light later on in the morning push your clock out. Um, but I think it's why all these film stars, you know, wear dark glasses when they're coming into Heathrow. Maybe, maybe that's one of the reasons, <laughs> I could be wrong. And you too should do that. You too should become a film star because you want to block that bright light at 7, 8 a.m. and then wait till later on in the morning and look up at the sun to get the light exposure. Uh, and, then, and then the same the next day. So they, they were my top tips what it's worth. Just my last is what happens if you've got a sleep problem and, and that uh, you, you want it investigated. 
But if there's a, a breathing problem like the sleep apnea, then we would want to monitor your breathing during sleep. And we would do this sort of study, looking at your breathing pattern and looking at whether you stop breathing and we'll measure your snoring within decibels. If there's a more complex problem that we're looking for and we need to know about the different stages of sleep, how much REM sleep you have, different stages, then we would do this additional monitoring of the brain waves. And then if it was a, an issue with your body clock um, a, or a circadian disorder, then we can measure your activity day and night activity just using something called an activity watch, which you wear on your wrist, and that looks at your activity levels. Uh, there are mobile apps coming along, some of them are quite good, although I think they're not quite up to diagnostic level, but you can at least uh, uh, get some idea of what your sleep pattern is at night. And, and sitting in the clinics as I do now, it's not unusual for people to um, come with their iPhones, especially pup wives and girlfriends who've recorded their husbands or their boyfriends overnight, and so I can hear the snoring and, and hear what's driving them. So with that, I wish you good night. Mm -hmm. <laughs>